Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have two wonderful poets with us today, Jack Grapes and Brendan Constantine. Jack will read first and then Brendan. Jack Grapes is a poet, actor, and teacher. He's published two books on his writing concepts, Method Acting and Advanced Method Acting. Method He's Writing. Method Writing. Advanced Method Writing. He's also the author of several books of poetry, The Naked Eye, New and Selected Poems, All the Sad Angels, Poems So Far, Any Style, and an upcoming book of 50 new poems and 100 paintings, Exit Music, due out later this year. His book, Wide Road to the Edge of the World, contains 301 haiku and a 300 plus page history of haiku and how he came to write it. Here's a magnificent poet, Jack Grapes. Thank you, Harry. Uh, you had his method writing. Uh, Stanislavski wrote method acting. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Uh, I have about five poems I'm going to read. Uh, they're all from my book, Exit Music, which features um, uh, 50 of my paintings and uh, 100 paintings and signage and stuff like that. Uh, this poem is called Meditation. You must meditate on that which you are. Focus on your breathing. Try to stop thinking about your dog. Did you feed it? Did you give it water? Did you close the gate? What if she rampages the neighborhood, knocks down a mailbox, strays into someone's saffron garden, eats a tomcat snoozing in the sun, chases that squirrel up a tree on the roof, across the houses, down the avenue to the car dealership on Wilshire Boulevard? What if she buys a sports car, swishes down an L.A. freeway, speeds along Pacific Coast Highway, drives the main street of Santa Barbara with the top down, the radio blaring, waving to all the good looking dogs strutting their stuff as she honks the horn and yelps like a rodeo cowgirl. Holy Humphrey Bogart. Who can meditate at a time like this? The world is about to come apart at the seams. Who the hell is awake to fix things? They're all sleeping. Wake up. Wake up. Quit thinking about your precious breath. Do something with this wild and wonderful life before your donkey escapes and eats your neighbor's cabbage. This poem is called Take Five. Dave Brubeck's Take Five is playing in the background. I heard Brubeck, Brubeck play this in a little jazz place on Carrollton Avenue, which was not in the quarter where you'd expect a jazz combo to be, but in some nondescript club near where the streetcars ran. I had a date with Barbara Heffer, red hair, throaty laugh, and I was hoping the music and the watered down bourbon would do the trick. After two minutes into the song, the sack guy, sax guy says, I gotta go to the John, be right back. Either piss or smack, who knew? Brubeck riffed a while on the ivory, then the drummer covered for him for another minute or two, and then the sax man comes back, grabs the axe, and jazz climbs back up into your head, and more bourbon goes down your gullet. And Barbara says, let's go back to my place. And I say, after the song. I'm not sure, but had she walked out on me at that point, I might have stayed anyway, just to hear it all go down. Every time I hear that song, like now, 63 years later, sitting here in my book-filled study, trying to write another poem, another riff on the same theme of love and loss and death and grief and solitude and solidarity. Riffs that never come out right. So you try again and again to get it right, though you never do. And then there I am. I'm back in that lounge bar on a nondescript slow night. I've barely begun my life. I'm back in New Orleans holding back every ounce of my future just so I could sit there and nurse that drink and hear that music and take five forever. This poem is called Directions. Some nights I am crossing a field, 
not a field of inquiry where one develops a depth of understanding or a field of endeavor like a chemist doing polymer research. A good field, to be sure. But the field I was crossing was one of those wide fields of barley you see in movies, fields turning gold in Ireland. On other nights, I am crossing a large body of water and I am in a small boat, a sturdy boat, to be sure, but still small, made even smaller by the size of the ocean. So vast all around me, stretching to the horizon, an ocean of waves, which is not a field. Some nights I am crossing a wide boulevard and I'm eight years old. And I remember how they told me not to cross the big boulevard. But I look both ways before stepping off the curb. And then I am caught in the middle, cars whooshing by me and up and down the boulevard, paying me no mild mind at all. But I am determined to get to the other side. So I stand there, vigilant, looking for a gap in the whooshing to make my mad dash to the other curb. Then some nights it's a hallway, so narrow that my shoulders scrape each side as I walk. I'm tempted to walk faster, but I don't. And I'm also tempted to walk slower, but I don't. I just walk. Not a stroll or a trudge, just a walk. So instead of scraping the walls on either side of me, I kind of slide along, taking my time, easing myself, you might say, along. And some nights I am nowhere, but there's a big moon, luminous, one of those fluorescent kinds of shining, dripping whiteness on the trees that seem to hold the earth in their roots, as if the earth would fall into the vastness of dark interstellar space were it not for the roots of those trees whose hands reach into the sky. And many times in my dreams, I'm in a hot air balloon, going from one cloud to another, the earth way down below. And then suddenly the bottom of my gondola scrapes the tips of the grass below and people are milling about waving at me. I must be high up in the mountains, I think. And these are the people who live high up in the mountains and no one ever visits them because they are so high up in the mountains. And here I come in my little gondola. I don't come from the bottom of the mountain. I come from the top of the sky, just gliding along from cloud to cloud. And I sing out to the people gathered there. I'm just passing through, I say. I can't stop. The wind keeps shoving me along like a giant finger, pushing me to the next cloud. But that it was nice to see them, and I wish I could stay longer. But the finger, you know, I said, shrugging my shoulders apologetically. The finger just keeps pushing, and I just go along for the ride. But but maybe, I say, maybe I'll be back tomorrow. Tomorrow being a good day to celebrate anything. Doesn't have to be important. We can celebrate the least important thing we got. We can celebrate bottle caps or someone's lucky penny or a small loaf of bread that just popped out of the oven. Oh, such a great smell. Fresh bread. Bye, I wave. Bye. Everyone waves. Bye-bye. We are all so happy celebrating the least important thing in our lives, but celebrating it as if it were God's appearance on earth, a total stranger lost in the middle of everything. God asking the people God created for directions. Okay. This poem is called Dust. Everybody has a song they sing in the shower. I'll get back to that later. For now, there's so much dust to contend with. Dust that is filtered down from the comets that pass too close. Those frozen leftovers from the formation of the solar system. Small bits of dirt, sand, ice, and rock. It's everywhere. I walk in the dust, sit in the dust. Step on the dust, touch the dust with the tips of my fingers, sloughed off skin cells, hair, clothing fibers, bacteria, dust mites, bits of dead bugs, soil, pollen, smoke, ash, salt crystals from the ocean, particles from volcanic eruptions, and microscopic specks of plastic, all heavy enough to see, light enough to be carried by the wind, an inverted mirror of our lives. When I read about beloved Erasmus, that 16th century humanist who wrote Praise of Folly, I honor the dust that is settled on page 37 where he writes, 
When I get a little money, I buy books. And if any is left, I buy food. I'm tempted to blow the dust away, but 20th century dust on 16th century Erasmus seems one way to honor his spirit. He loved everything. The chief element of happiness, you wrote, is this, to want to be what you are. So at the end of the day, happy to be what I am, armed with quotes from Erasmus and covered with the dust of inconsequential passion for every speck of life that falls on my shoulders. I step into the stream of a hot shower and sing. Uh, this is the fifth one. You know, everything is contained between Woody Allen and Leo Tolstoy. Everything in life is either war and peace or love and death. Uh, I've had my share of love and uh, war and peace. And as I get older, uh, you know, uh, death becomes not existential, but but something real. Uh, so I think this poem comes from that sense that death has become not a existential philosophical issue, but a uh, a real thing. This is called Outskirts. I woke up in a small room. I was alone. Maybe this is death, I thought. When you're alive, everything that encloses you gets smaller and smaller. First, it's the cities. They, they close in around you. Abstract nomenclature of solitude and exclusion. At some point as you drive, you reach that magical place, the outskirts of the city. No sign that says border wall or you can't keep driving or turn back. Just a vague hand scrawled sign that says you've reached the outskirts of the city. So maybe I thought this small room is just that, the outskirts. You've been there before, haven't you? But soon that city gets smaller. It's not a city anymore. It's just a small town on the outskirts of the city. Then after your heart surgery, just your neighborhood, beyond which you can't walk or even drive, you pass the same metal gate on Sweetser, the same cobblestone driveway in La Jolla, the same fenced-in yard on Drexel. Time to turn back, but you keep walking. I know what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for the outskirts. But the neighborhood on the outskirts of the town, which is situated on the outskirts of the city, keeps shrinking. And then your house shrinks. And soon, it's just this room. Then this bed. And one day, you'll be on the outskirts of the bed. A hand will feel your forehead. A pair of lips will brush your cheek. Someone will whisper in your ear, asking if you're awake, if you're still breathing, if you're still alive. I'm fine, I'll say. I'm fine, you'll say too. We're all fine, we'll say. We're on the outskirts. No one is here. Just you, alone in your small room begging anyone within earshot. I'm on the outskirts. Come get me. And um, oh, I read dust. So where's number five? Oh, wait. Oh, I just read number five. Oh, next one. <laughs> Forgot where I was. Um, this is called How to Become a Writer, and it's it's not in my book. Uh, I just wrote it not long ago. How to Become a Writer. Night, dark night. My brother is sleeping in the bed next to me. I'm waiting to hear if my father comes home. I'll be able to hear his car come into the driveway next to my window. It's late. He's not coming home, probably. He and mom had a fight, so he's out drinking. He won't come home tonight. If he comes home, it'll be to get more money so he can go out and drink some more. Then he comes home all drunk and falls asleep in the bed, and mom has to call the doctor because he has diabetes. So that's bad. He could die or something. I can hear the rain on the tin roof of the shed in the backyard. No moon, just dark night. 
tomorrow is school. The school bus comes by to pick me up, the big yellow bus. I can't remember what the teacher says. All I can think of is, will my father come home? Will he be safe? Will he drive crazy and crash into a tree? Will he be in the hospital like last time? The teacher is talking. She's writing something on the blackboard. She's writing hard because she's mad about something. She's writing so hard that the chalk breaks and falls on the floor. Sometimes she grabs my ear and drags me up to the blackboard because I didn't remember what she said. So she rubs my nose and the chalk stuff on the blackboard. There's white chalk stuff on my nose and the other kids laugh. I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking, is my father coming home? Will he be safe? Will he crash into a tree? Will, will he be dead? Mrs. Cook makes me go back to my desk. My desk is over by the windows. I'm in the stupid row. Jimmy and Eugene and Steve are with me in the stupid row. We're all in the stupid row, but they're not stupid. And neither am I. I can read. But the teacher put me in the stupid row. I could spell Ritz crackers. I saw it on a billboard one night when my father was driving the car down Carrollton Avenue. It said Ritz crackers. I can spell it. R-I-T-Z. I know. Sometimes I spell other words wrong because I'm thinking about my father and wondering if he's coming home or will he crash into a tree. I know how to add and subtract, but I get it wrong sometimes because daddy is not home and he's not coming home. And right now he could be crashing into a tree. And then what will we do? The whole world will be in a fog. I feel small, little. I'm in the back of the bus and listen to the other kids talking. Did I forget my school bag? No, here it is. Is my reader inside? Yeah, run away home. I read it all the way through. Everybody came home. Not my father. He may never come home. So all my life, I've been a writer, a poet, a teacher. And this is what has given my life meaning, and I have no perfect way to teach anyone. What I do know is that you don't teach the lesson. You teach the person. What do they need? What do they want now, right now, this moment, when they might be in a fog and worried that their father might not be coming home? You have to see them, look into their eyes, make them believe. What I know is that I came out of the fog of fear when I began to believe in myself. And it wasn't a lesson or a curriculum. It was the teacher who helped me see who I was and what I could be. I was in second grade and she took us all to see an exhibition of Van Gogh's paintings. This was 1949, and it was the first important tour of all his paintings in the United States. Vincent was from Amsterdam, and so was my mother. I remember the teacher telling us all about Van Gogh, and I listened hard because my mother was from Amsterdam, and I saw how he put the paint on the canvas, kind of sloppy, big globs of paint, just like I did when the art teacher came to our school and taught us how to draw. I couldn't take my eyes off the paintings. Yellow cornfields, black crows, bright sun. Something in me changed. The dark fog went away. I knew who I was. He painted like I painted. So I decided I was going to be a painter. Once in art class, the teacher looked at my painting and said, why don't you paint a tree? And I said, this is a tree. I was going to make art. I had no idea what I would paint, maybe a tree. Mostly, I wanted to make art that would make the dark fog go away. Not for me, necessarily, but for everyone else. I wanted to say to others that no matter how long the fog lasts, you can make it go away. You can see through it. You can know who you are and believe in yourself and not be afraid and not be worried if your father doesn't come home. That was the year I wrote a story in my loose leaf binder about a boy who was lost and couldn't find his way to the bathroom. Because when they explained in the school where the bathroom was, he was worrying about his father and would he come home? So he looked and he looked and he walked all over the school, but he couldn't find the bathroom. So when he got back to his class, he sat down on his desk and just peed in his pants. It was warm and it ran down his legs. It felt better after he peed, but now what? 
the bell rang and all the kids ran out to the front of the school where they got into cars or the yellow school bus and went home. But the little boy stayed in his desk and Miss Sturch, the teacher, came over and said, Jackie, what's wrong? And the boy started to cry. I peed in my pants, he said, and my father is not coming home. He might crash into a tree and be dead. Mrs. Turch bent down so she could see the boy's face. They were face to face. The teacher was wearing a very red shirt. That's what the boy remembered most, the red shirt with shiny white buttons. And her neck, it was a beautiful neck. She bent down so they were face to face. She said, when you walk to the school bus, carry a school bag in front of you so the other kids won't see how you wet your pants. That was all she said. That was what the boy was mostly worried about, even more than his father crashing into a tree with the other kids know he peed in his pants. She told him to get up and get going before the yellow school bus left. So he walked to the yellow school bus parked in front of the school, carrying his school bag in front of him so no one could see that he had peed in his pants. When the bus got to his house, he held the school bag in front and walked nonchalantly to the front door like nothing was wrong. And that was the end of my story. I showed it to Miss Sturtz the next day, and she liked it. She changed one word. That was all. Good story, she said. Then she leaned down, so we were face to face again. And she whispered, so no one else could hear. You can write anything you want. It can be true, or you can make it all up. You could be a writer. When I got home that day, a car was parked in the driveway. It didn't look like it had crashed into a tree. When I went inside, my dad was in the kitchen drinking coffee. He asked, how was school today? I'm going to be a writer, I said. My father got up, opened the refrigerator to get some milk. Then he sat back down and poured the milk into his coffee. Good idea, he said. Good idea. Thank you, Jack. That was magnificent. I want to just say a couple of things about your reading, and then Jennifer Clymer, our director, has something to say. But your poetry, you know, I've known you for, gosh, since the late, early, late, probably the mid-70s, and I've always loved your poetry. You always have such great clarity and precision and such a fluency, and you have such a wonderful imagination, but you always are rooted in the here and now. And what I like about your poetry, it's a celebration of life. And you're also optimistic. And I can see why you're such a wonderful teacher. And, and uh, so it's a pleasure, as always, to have you on. Uh, I want to ask you a question before uh, Jennifer comes back on. Uh, it's nothing to do with the um, poetry, but I know you're a wonderful actor. Could you just briefly, in a, like a minute, or two, tell us your top 10 films of all time. Oh, my God. Holy cow. Uh, Ikiru, uh, The Bicycle Thief, um, uh, uh, Random Harvest uh, with Ronald Coleman and Greer Garson. Uh, uh, Godfather, obviously. Citizen Kane, obviously. Deer Hunter, obviously. Um uh, God, there's so many, Harry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm flooding. Uh, uh, that's all I can think of at the moment, but there's so many, you know. Uh, well, you're wonderful. Oh, yeah, Char Charlie Chaplin's um, City Lights, of course. You, great, great movie. Um, what is that, seven? Did I get to seven? I need, I need three more. All the rest of them. <laughs> I, you know, I, li I love movies. So, so even a bad movie I like sometimes, you know, sometimes I love a really bad movie. There was a movie on TV the other night and the actress was so bad. It was fascinating. It was fascinating. You know, <laughs> well, you know, uh, Charlie Chaplin, one thing in City Lights, he could make you love and cry. And at the end with that rose with the blind, uh, you know, he um, you saw well, his soul. you saw his soul with that right there. But uh, thank you, Jack, and you're you're a marvelous poet and actor, as I know, and uh, I've never studied with you, but I've heard a lot of wonderful reports, and I can see why through your poetry, but uh, let me introduce our director, 
she has something to say that involves all of us outside of poetry, but it is to do with poetry too, because we're involved here at MPTF with that. Here's our director, Jennifer, Cle Jennifer Clymer. Um, before I, I do my uh, little song and dance, I want to say, uh, Jack, that's an amazing list of films. And we actually are going to be talking about Citizen Kane at three o'clock today on a film, a show that we do on the live show called You Be the Critic. Um, so that show, we focus on a single film once a week. Um, we've done The Bicycle Thief, The Godfather, uh, Citizen Kane is today. Uh, we need to add the deer hunter, I think, to that list for sure. Yeah, and don't forget Ikiru and um, uh, the, the remake of uh, um, Ikiru was done by in England with Bill Nye. Oh yes, um, yeah, living. But 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 Ikiru is 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 a much greater film, and it's a two act film. Usually, most films and things there there's always the three act structure. Ikiru is a two act structure. You don't see that very often, but it's a great two act structure. We'll add that to our list as well. Um, yeah, the I first wondered... act the first act goes forward, and the second act goes backwards. It's really amazing. Yeah, amazing. Beautiful. Um, so just quickly, I wanted to thank you both for being here and thanks to all the people who are tuning in. Um, the, what you are experiencing right now is part of a live variety show that was started during the pandemic. Um, this was a way to keep the residents at MPTF creatively engaged um, and emotionally and, and mentally well. We are a charity that helps everyone in the entertainment industry and right now are the part of our charity that does financial assistance and social service for people who work in the entertainment community currently is really struggling we've gotten over 10 times the amount of calls that we normally field from people um because of obviously um how the strikes are devastating the work stoppage that's happened so I wanted to thank you guys for participating with us today and invite you to always come back on a Tuesday for Harry's Poetry. But if there is a possibility for you to learn more about MPTF, please take that opportunity. Um, and if there's any way that you can assist financially or through learning more about us and advocating for people who might be struggling and are in need right now, I, I just wanted to take this chance to, to speak to the audience to say that. So thanks for letting me uh, steal a little bit of time from this amazing show. I am captivated. There's other work I should be doing, but I'm not. <laughs> well, thank thank you. you very much, Jennifer. I am, you know, one of the recipients of MPTF. So I've been overwhelmingly grateful to MPTF ever since my late wife and I, Holly, moved here in 2017. But let's get back to poetry. Brendan Constantine is a poet based in Los Angeles. He is the author of several collections of poetry, most recently, Dementia, My Darling, from Red Hen Press. His work has appeared in many literary standards, including Poetry, The Nation, Best American Poetry, Plowshares, Tin House, and Poem A Day. He currently teaches at the Windward School Here's a brilliant poet, Brendan Constantine. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to share today. It is a profound uh, honor. And I can't believe I have to follow Jack Grapes. <laughs> just, 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 there's just no way to do it. And uh, um, I believe, uh, Harry, I met you and Jack uh, right around the same time, would have been uh, around 1994, 95. And uh, uh, it is... Uh, I, you know, and when I talked to folks about uh, when I came to poetry, uh, I always emphasize lucky to so surrounded by some very tall trees, and, and you're the trees I'm talking about. Um, it uh, uh, it is uh, it is a delight uh, to to you know all these years later to to continue as your as your friend and your student. Uh, so thank you so much for your work, gentlemen, and, and for your example. Um, I'm going to read a mix of uh, older and newer things. Um, this uh, this uh, first poem had its origins in the uh, pandemic. 
And this is called What's Not to Love. What's not to love about a broken bowl? Now, two half bowls, still ready to hold what they can, even if that's nothing. What's not to love about weeds and weeds and weeds that crowd the yard and thrive amazingly on the same nothing? What's not to love about a virus crowding the blood, putting a doll of itself in each cell and sailing it away to find fortune in the heart? What's not to love about the dying heart with its four dark rooms full of grass and broken china, a sheeted piano about to play? What's not to love about a sonata played by a lonely child who would rather do anything else, sleep in a garden or pull up the flowers, who would rather be sick? What's not to love about reading aloud to someone fast asleep, about not stopping, not even when a bowl slides from the bed and crashes like a bell in water. This, um, this next poem is for uh, anyone living with an animal who's had uh, to make sacrifices for that particular arrangement. Um, it's in three very short sections, and I always feel like I should warn an audience when something's in numbered sections, because it, it's always a little dicey. As soon as you hear the poet say, well, this is in numbered sections, like, oh, how long are we going to be here? There are three very short sections, I promise, and this should go by pretty quickly. This is called Three Paintings Eaten by Dogs. One. A woman in a straw hat ribbon trailing, eyes lost in shadow. She waves from a beach to where a sky should be, but isn't. There is half a cloud. There is one wing. Two, a man with white hair, a blue suit and necktie. He looks at us, ready to answer any question not found in the books behind him. Don't be alarmed by his missing chest, his pulverized desk. These are his credentials. And three, because you gotta have a landscape. A mountain pass, late winter, pine trees loaded with snow, gone pink at evening. They lean away from an enormous hole in the world, so big, you can see its skeleton, wet, flimsy, put together in a rush. We might have known. Lately, um, I've been increasingly fascinated by uh, uh, the way a lot of our discourse, uh, particularly in social media, seems to mimic uh, the language of memes and how compressed a lot of our sort of digital discourse is now and what constitutes having a conversation, uh, how informational uh, a lot of the, you know, social media posts that we are relying on more and more as a means of sort of, you know, continuing to make contact with people around us. Anyways, the language in this poem uh, borrows from that heavily. And I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't know where it was going to go, but I, I knew what I wanted to do at the beginning. And uh, I, I figured that what I would do is I would go to um, a website purporting to have interesting facts and that I would find two facts from it. And I would use these somewhere in a litany. Uh, so there, there are two true things in here, and then I've made up everything else. This is called Any Given Time. Many supermarket apples are already a year old. Some of the oldest cultures have no word for mud. The miniature horse 
is the only other mammal known to enjoy gossip. 60% of babies born in the United States can identify one suspect. Most handguns do not recognize their owners. The first road signs were apologies. 80% of all nocturnal discourse is held within hearing of a moth. It is impossible to hum while holding your nose, but easy to drown while singing. There are strangers who have watched you eat and still think about it. Love often appears in X-ray photography as a cloudy, indistinct area. This sentence is beautiful. May I please go ahead of you? I just have this one oyster. At any given time, there is a long line of ghosts waiting to whisper in your ear. Some, when finished, immediately head for the back of the line to go again. Others say only one thing and join other lines. This uh, next poem uh, draws some inspiration from the, um, uh, the conceit in painting of uh, creating the effect of, of three dimensions. Uh, and it uses a, a term, the, the art of doing this, of course, is almost as old as painting itself, but uh, the name that we use for it, or that became sort of fashionable for uh, understanding the principle of painting three dimensions in two, uh, is a French term, meaning a trick on the eye, uh, trompe l'oeil. This, uh, this poem uh, is about a, a particular kind of three-dimensional rendering done in only two dimensions. This is Trompe l'oeil. Who was first to trace a dead body in chalk? No one seems to know. One book says it started as a courtesy for the press, a way to photograph a murder without the murder. But who was first to do it? And why did they have chalk with them that day? It isn't procedure anymore as it contaminates the scene. But an officer told me sometimes people go ahead and trace the body before he even gets there. They've seen it on TV and think it helps. He says police call this a visit from the chalk fairy. And once he said there was a witness who couldn't find anything to trace with, so he used popcorn and candy which he later recovered and ate during questioning. I can't decide if that's artistic genius or just the loneliest thing I've ever heard. Nor can I stop thinking about that first man because of course it was a man who took chalk from a sandwich board or a frightened bartender. I can see him, a beat cop, bored but earnest, a young man with time to kill, while a village doctor dressed in the dark and drove to town. Only a few poems left, not that many. Um, this is, um, um, I'm sad to say, a very contemporary poem. This is called Active Shooter. It takes 12 minutes to start my mother's day. From the time I wake her to when I set a tray of coffee, toast, a soft boiled egg. One American will be shot in that time and another two before I clear it all away. This morning I find her already wakeful taking aim with a black remote. On her bed-sized television, the words active shooter 
caption a pair of school flags and policemen crouched in a sandbox. My mother says the words aloud. 12 minutes later, our telephones buzz with ads for active wear. Should I buy her a bulletproof shawl? It's $40, soft, elegant, tactical, good for seniors on the run. Someday there'll be more of us in poems than anywhere else. I wonder if I'll be told to carry a gun as a school teacher, which is to say, I wonder what quitting will be like. Will I be able to live on what I've made? How long before the world is American? The TV has filled with mothers. I blink and realize I'm late with breakfast, late to cut bread, grind beans, late to boil water and put a bright egg in the middle. My mother repeats the words as I step away, keeps saying them like playing out a rope for me to follow back to her. Soft, elegant, tactical. Dear God of the gas stove, dear clock of blue fire, thank you for what darkens in us every day. Maybe we'll just do uh, one more, I think. I think that's enough. It's been such a rich uh, reading. Uh, Jack, I was so moved by what you were reading today. Um, and uh, I realized uh, that this, uh, this series uh, probably requires uh, or expects that we'll be a little better behaved but I'd started to take quotes from what you were reading and throw them at that. I thought, oh, maybe they don't do that here. So I only got one out there. Uh, but anyway. Um, I love that. I love that last poem, the line that soon there'll be more of us in poetry than anywhere else. <laughs> that was great. Bless you. Bless you. All right. This, uh, this last poem uh, is in two parts. Um, and I guess there's, I guess there's a writing exercise in here. And the exercise is to think about, you know, the poem that you can't seem to write and write, uh, start by writing about why you can't write about it or what you get wrong. And then in the second part, now you really have to write the poem. So this, as I say, is in two parts. Uh, it's my, my last uh, piece for uh, this afternoon and I thank you all very much for your attention. This is called The Wrong Poem. One, I keep writing the wrong poem, keep leaving out the sheep and cows, the fact of a farm so close to the sea. I start with the idea of cruelty, how old it is, but not as old as actual cruelty, which predates thinking. And next thing I know, I've skipped over centuries of context, how I'm only visiting, the farmer and her children aren't my friends, just nice people ready to help. Really, I ought to leave them out of this part altogether, but the coat and the bed were such a surprise. She wouldn't take money, not even for the shoes and phone calls. And now I've done it again, wrong poem, wrong mood, wrong everything. Why, why does it feel holy when a horse eats from your palm, the brush of its lips and breath, the wet of its tongue, what heaven would I go to if I let it swallow my arm? A different one with goats and a beach, fat geese. My first morning here, I walked to the water and saw ghosts grazing the sand with metal detectors, slow mo, thorough, courteously spaced. The poem I keep failing to write is what I would say to them, broken into lines I could scratch on hunks of tin and scatter in the surf of head of them. A poem with lines arranged in order of discovery, some perhaps not appearing for years. It could begin like this. Let me tell you about sunlight. Two, let me tell you about sunlight. Slant sunlight, 
down the walls of the house and barn. Let me tell you how to undo cruelty, a window at a time. A sandy path through the grass, a green bottle. Let me repeat the words, or few or none, that soothe the great loneliness of noon. Let me show you how to almost close your eyes, bring the world back to its first shapes. Black and gray, what could be simpler? Your parents were a blur that broke and rebroke. Where are they anyway? Let me assure you we're all on the beach. Some of us further up shore than others, but we're with you. Looking out toward the water, our hands to our foreheads, heels sunk a little deeper, maybe, the wind putting the same clumsy kiss to our ears. We hear it say what you hear it say and understand it differently. Let me find you a blanket, a small shell to turn in your fingers. Not far beneath our feet are precious coins, rare jewels, the glass bones of angels, their trumpets bent, but playable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brendan. Your poetry moved me deeply. There's a, there's a tenderness and a, a poignancy and erudition in there. And you really ask some probing questions. And there's a, a humanity in there too that uh, you know, just really is, is awakening, if you will. Could, uh, could, could you just tell us a little bit about, about yourself regarding poetry? Let's start with, when did you write your first poem? Oh my God. Uh, well, I, I think like a lot of poets, I was, I probably, you know, I think a lot of people write poetry uh, early on. Uh, um, Nemirov says that it might actually be a ritual of, you know, adolescence. Um, uh, and, uh, and because it seems to be for most people, a ritual of, of adolescence, uh, you could say that poets are people that have just never quite grown up. My first poems, gosh, uh, the first poem that I can remember really thinking about and really concentrating on, I was in seventh grade, and it got into the school yearbook. Um, but I didn't have any, I didn't have any sense of myself as a poet, a poet. I thought, you know, I did that, but it wasn't something that I was interested necessarily in pursuing. Um, and then into um, into my early 20s, I, I, I remember reading poetry and enjoying poetry, but it just never occurred to me that, uh, that I would be able to contribute to poetry in any serious way. It really didn't happen for me in earnest until I was in my late 20s. I was about 27 before I thought, oh, I, you know, there's, there's, there's something here for me that this, this might be the, uh, the art form that I follow. I had, I had tried my hand at a bunch of others. So the answer is either seventh grade or 27. <laughs> you know, I, when you read that poem about your mom, you know, there's such a tenderness in there. I had a loving mother too. And you always, in, what I always notice in your poetry, obviously there's erudition and eloquence, but there's also a, a, a wondrous turn of phrase that you have. You know, it's uh, theatrical in some sense, but it's also very deeply human and it's very inner too. And so I always appreciate that about your poetry. When you begin to write a poem, uh, what, what do you, what, how do you begin? Do you, do you start with an idea, an image, a, a, a line of, of words or how do you begin your first, begin a poem? My answer to that is yes. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, frustratingly, you know, I, I'd have to say, there, there's, there's, there's no longer any one impetus. I know that when I was younger, uh, and 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 I think this is an important part of the the uh, the maturation of a poet. I, I really think it's it's very important, very early on. Uh, at least it was for me to be equally in love with the idea of being a poet uh, as I was with with any art that I was actually promulgating. Uh, so in the early days, I might have had very fixed notions of, of how I was to start and how a poem should begin. Now, of course, virtually anything may set me off. Sometimes I have a very clear idea of at least, ne I never have a sense of where it's going to end. 
Um, and uh, I used to, and, and experience has taught me to not do so much of that, uh, to really let the poem go where it wants to go. But I will have a sense of, um, uh, you know, uh, almost as though uh, where I would like to find myself in the course of it. So that might be, you know, dwelling among particular kinds of images. Uh, it might be speaking in a particular way. Um, um, you know, some, you know, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a phrase and I think, oh, that'd be a great title for a poem. And I don't know what the poem is enough, you know, and I'll certainly might approach a poem that way. Um, uh, more often than not, though, it, lately, it's been um, that uh, I, I get some sort of a feeling that I want to be in the middle of somehow. Um, and, and so I write to get in the middle of it and then see what can happen to me in it. Um, that's, you know, uh, that's at least that's where I am at, at 56, um, you know, having, having accepted that, um, that writer's block is usually just having way too much judgment. And that if I can get past that initial impulse to edit before I've even gotten anything on the page, you know, and just, I just, you know, I just sort of tell myself, whatever is the first things that come out of my pen are going to suck. That's just, that's just the rule. But I need to pile a bunch of them up so I can get to that middle space and find myself in the middle of the poem wherever. So I gotta, you know, um, I've gotta, I've gotta, you know, pile up a bunch of stuff and get to that, you know, if I can just, you know, do that. So that's so I'll tend to, I'll tend to do that. I'll tend to, you know, I say this is this is I want to be in the middle of this room. I gotta figure out how to get into that room. You know, you know, Harry, when I can't think of how to start a poem, I call Brendan. And I ask him to send me any of the lines that he hasn't used. And he only charges me $10 for 20. So it's a good deal. It's, it's a deal we worked out over the last 30 yeah. years. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and in you exchange, got a, you got a good line. I need a line to start a poem. Yeah. He's, he's being modest. He also powers my house with his heart. Uh, so. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> I think oh, Jack oh, owns us you, all. You know, you know why that is, Brendan? Mm -hmm. That's because my trumpet may be bent, but as a great poet once said, it's still playable. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that that's one of the best lines I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, thank, wow. Okay. Well, okay. No, you know, but isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that true for all of us? I mean, you know, our trumpets are bent, but they're playable. Okay. Like, and, okay. And I, but I, I want to point something out of here. You're you're in a room with three balding men, okay? Uh, it's not fair to make any of them blush. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, Harry is in the best shape. He can he can do this. Yeah, balding. Look Harry, you look at Harry. He's got, got a. <laughs> he, Harry could take his eyebrows and transplant them up here, and it'd be fine. <laughs> well, the reason I thought of doing that, I actually thought. Like, because my hairline starts like a back hair. I thought, what if I shave my eyebrows off? And then I grew two new ones all the way back here. And it just looks shocked all the time. I thought, I go running into Trader Joe's. Do you have vitamins? You know, it would be amazing. Let's let's get back to you two guys. You're the guests and you're the ones we want to learn from. So I'm going to ask Brendan this and then Jack. And we have a couple minutes left. Just briefly, you both are wonderful teachers. So let's start with Brendan. What do you tell a young woman who's beginning, sitting down to write her first poem? Brendan, what would you tell her to focus on? Oh my gosh. Well, I, I usually tell any student, don't worry about this being a poem. If, even if you know you're sitting down to write a poem, don't, don't, don't worry about that as you're writing. Just start getting stuff to land on the page. Uh, just, uh, just pour it out. Um, and, uh, uh, and don't, you know, uh, my friend uh, Samantha says, you know, there are three questions. What does this mean? Where is it going? Is it any good? <laughs> Those are none of your business. Uh, you know, so, you know, at least when you're, when you're sitting down to write for the first time, just, you know, so I would say, I would say jump in. And I really want to hear what uh, Jack has to say to this. Jack. Well, I'm, I'm kind of old school, you know. I, I would just say to someone, who's beginning to write, uh, I just say to them, don't forget your pencil has feelings too. Mm. <laughs> That's oh, it. Okay, nice. 
Well, you too. Hey, no pencil. It's like, you know, I'm still thinking of pencil, <laughs> you know. I mean, maybe the keyboard's got feelings. I don't know, you know. Uh, but but you know, there's something about the instrument. Mm -hmm. I think the instrument is holy. And don't forget it. Because everything goes from your heart, through your arm, down to the fingertip, and to whether you're typing or whether you're writing, the instrument is connected to the heart. So that's what I meant when I said, remember, your pencil has feelings, too. Well, Blake said everything is holy. And Blake also said energy is eternal delight. And both of you have, have delighted us today with your fabulous poetry and your, your erudition. And it's time to end. I could listen to both of you for forever. So uh, you've really uplifted me and, and enraptured all of us with your wonderful poetry. So uh, before we go, we have to let our audience know who's coming next week. Next week, we have two wonderful poets, Clive Matson and Jamie Halloran. And here's our wonderful director, Jennifer Clymer, to take us home. Harry, thank you so much. Brendan, Jack, that was a really amazing hour. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I don't know, are you guys in Los Angeles? Where are you in the world? You're in LA? Yeah, can I well, well, I'm in LA. I'm I'm in LA. You can sort of tell by, you know, I'm I'm in LA. Yeah, you know, the air here is really bad. Yeah, we're both uh, we're both LA poets. Great. Yeah, we're both well, LA poets. Uh, you know, Harry, invite them out and let's uh, let's do a little tour. And maybe next time it's not on Zoom, but you guys are actually in our theater. That would be great. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. Cool. Um, great. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. Come back, back next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Uh, next Tuesday at 1 p.m. And again, it's Jamie O'Halloran and who? Clive Matson. Clive Matson from San Matson. Francisco. I Fantastic. love the guy. Terrific guy. That's going to be a that's going to be a dynamite uh, lineup. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and Brendan, it was great to read with you. By the way. Oh my my my. It was a pleasure. And always good to see Harry. Harry, yeah. hope you're doing great. Love you, man. Love you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.